Welcome to On Contact. Today, we speak with the black revolutionaries, Mumia Abu-Jamal and Pam and Ramona Africa. That's how the state works, by demonizing people and then putting them in places where they're virtually invisible. On Contact with Chris Hedges. Mumia Abu-Jamal, who was a young activist in the Black Panthers and later, one of the most important journalists in Philadelphia, has long been the bete noir of the state. The FBI opened a file on him when he was 15, when he first started working with a local chapter of the Black Panthers. He was suspended from his Philadelphia high school when he campaigned to rename the school for Malcolm X and distributed black revolutionary student power literature. He became one of the city's most important investigative journalists, exposing police violence and lifting up the voices of black radicals until he was sentenced in a 1981 trial for the murder of a Philadelphia police officer. RT correspondent Anya Parampel looks at the state persecution of Mumia Abu-Jamal. In July 1982, Mumia Abu-Jamal was sentenced to death for the murder of a white Philadelphia police officer. 35 years later, he has become for many a symbol of a racially biased justice system and representative of the faults of capital punishment. In 1981, Abu Jamal was a former member of the Black Panther Party and supported the radical MOVE organization. He was working as a freelance radio reporter in Philadelphia covering police brutality and corruption when he was arrested for the murder of Officer Daniel Faulkner. According to testimony, Abu Jamal saw his brother in a struggle with Faulkner during a traffic stop. He approached the scene. A short time later, police found the officer shot dead and Abu Jamal wounded from the officer's gun. Abu Jamal's legally registered gun was found nearby. He was convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Yet it's a crime Abu Jamal says he did not commit. Amnesty International found the court proceedings failed to meet international standards and said, quote, justice would be served by a new trial. A call supported by the NAACP, the European Parliament, and the Congressional Black Caucus. Twice, Abu Jamal narrowly escaped death. After multiple petitions to the court, fighting against the makeup of the jury and racism by the trial judge, in 2001, a court found his death sentence unconstitutional because the sentencing jury was improperly instructed. His sentence was commuted to life in prison without parole. In 2011, after multiple appeals, Philadelphia prosecutors announced they would not seek another death sentence to the dismay of his critics, he has gained international notoriety while on death row for his prolific writings and commentary from behind bars. His free Mumia movement became popular on college campuses and abroad. Yet controversy continues to surround the case. Dear fellow Goddardites, students, graduates, parents, professors, after Goddard College invited Abu Jamal to record a commencement address to its students in 2014, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett signed the Revictimization Relief Act in 2014 to curb what he called the, quote, obscene celebrity cultivated by people like Abu Jamal. It allowed victims of violent crime like Faulkner's wife to sue offenders from speech that would cause, quote, mental anguish. Six months later, the law was deemed unconstitutional because it violated First Amendment rights of convicted criminals. Even the lawyers who represented Abu Jamal's appeal have faced backlash. The Senate rejected President Obama's appointment of attorney Dedbo Agjabail to lead the Justice Department's Office on Civil Rights in 2014 because he filed civil rights abuse briefs on Abu Jamal's behalf. Mumia Abu Jamal will likely spend the rest of his days behind bars, but he has continuously transcended his imprisonment and proven his commentary on the human condition cannot be restricted. Thank you, Anya. Mumia Abu-Jamal joins us today by phone from the SCI Mahoney State Prison in Frackville, Pennsylvania. He has published seven books in prison, including his searing and best-selling Live from Death Row, which Dick Gregory says single-handedly brought dignity to the whole death row. His voice is a continuum of the black prophetic fire of David Walker, Nat Turner, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and Malcolm X. So, Mumia, I want to ask you about this neo-slave narrative that you write about on live on death row, from death row, 
uh, and how black radicals like you who counter that narrative, why it's so incendiary to the state. What's necessary for the state is the illusion of normality, regularity. So, uh, you know, think about this. In Rome, uh, what the emperors needed was bread and circuses. Uh, in America, what we need is uh, housewives of Atlanta. Uh, we need sports. And we need, um, you know, uh, these uh, moral stories of good cops and evil people. And uh, because you have that, because you really have what you know perfectly, having read your books, you know that you know there is no critical thinking in the United States in this period. You have emotion, right? And if I can right. get you to now look at someone who's demonized, then I can do anything. I can do anything. And uh, that's how the state works, by demonizing people and then putting them in places where they're virtually invisible. You write in the book about how that th this kind of neo-slave narrative, it, it sells because it gives the false illusion that there's somehow escape from the system, that, that no one is absolutely guilty, nor the oppressed, the slave, the prisoner, absolutely guiltless. Right, exactly. And here's the, here's the, here's the reality. America has never come to grips with what a lot of scholars and thinkers call its original sin. And that's because it never stopped happening. Think about this. This country that, uh, you know, brags about being founded on freedom was founded on slavery, was founded on Holocaust, was founded on genocide. And after slavery ended, after the Constitution was rewritten and amended, and we had the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, well, what did the South do? They ignored it for a century. You know, there were a few bright years, Reconstruction, and then there was redemption where that was destroyed. And it isn't until the 60s that you see this deep, rich emergence of people fighting for rights that were enshrined in the Constitution a century before. That's because every state in the South and many states in the North were allowed to make exceptions to the Constitution. Those exceptions uh, when it came to black people. And we've learned that that's not just the Southern reality. You can't talk about AEDTA, the so-called anti-terrorism death penalty, unless you have the same mindset that makes the Constitution an exceptional document. Uh, only this is a call able from Pennsylvania State people. Correctional Institution, Mahanoy. This call is subject to reporting and monitoring. That's what we have. And we have the same thing with a different name. In 1968, I think it was, when George Wallace was running for president, he held a rally in Philadelphia, and you were 14 at the time. You attended that rally with three of your friends, uh, and it, it was right out of a, I mean, it was out of a Trump reality, a Trump rally. Can you explain what took place? We had the illusion of freedom. So this was our city. We were born and raised there. We went down to what's called the spectrum. And, you know, like, <laughs> it sounds silly now, but, you know, imagine five or six, you know, young teenage boys shouting black power in the middle of a Wallace for president. Okay, rally. I'm not going to let you stop there, because you were also shouting Ungawa. <laughs> Ungawa, black power. It sounded, you know, rhythmic. It sounded sexy. Well, you said we didn't know um, what it meant, but it had a hell of a ring to it. <laughs> yeah, it sounded good. I mean, I still don't know what it means, but, you know, it okay. sounded good. Well, people began spitting at us. Uh, people began uh, ripping flags from their sticks and throwing sticks at us and just, you know, just howling at us and shouting at us. Well, some police came and other security, and they escorted us out, and we thought, hey, well, you know, we had a little fun, and... We, you know, our voices were heard, and we went to the bus stop, and um, two or three of us were on the bus, a young guy named Alvin and a guy named Eddie, and I was like, I'm usually the slowest, so I was behind them. A guy walked up and hit me with a blackjack and knocked me down and pulled Eddie and pulled Alvin off the buses, and we were getting our asses kicked. Um, 
it never dawned on us that these were cops because you can't just walk up and beat people up. Well, I remember seeing a cop's leg walk by, and I said, help, help, police. And the guy looked at me, looked down at me, and he walked over and he kicked me right in the face. Then it dawned on me that all of these guys were cops. And uh, that was uh, a little taste of Rizzo, a little taste of Philadelphia, and an introduction to Trump. Uh, we see it today. I mean, I, I can hear Trump saying, you know, yeah, beat the hell out of him. In the old days, well, I lived in those days. They weren't good days. They were ugly days, and they're ugly days today. Listen, I'm on another brother's time. Chris, I got to go. I love you all. Uh, I okay, really Mumia. it's great to hear your voice. All right. On the move, y'all. You're an inspiration to us all. As are you, sir. I'm now joined in the studio by Ramona and Pam Africa from the revolutionary organization MOVE. They are also organizers with the international concerned family and friends of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Ramona is the last remaining survivor of the 1985 MOVE bombing. Ramona, we're at the 32nd anniversary this weekend of the attack on the MOVE house, the murder of 11 of your family members, including five children. Perhaps you can just briefly remind viewers what took place 32 years ago this weekend. Well, on May 12th, Sunday, Mother's Day of 1985, our home was surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of cops who came out there to kill. Because of our unrelenting fight for our MOVE sisters and brothers known as the MOVE 9, who had been attacked and arrested in 1978. Uh, Many of whom are still in prison. 39 years later this August, they are still right. in prison after becoming eligible for parole in 2008. The parole board just right. refuses to parole them. But what people really need to understand is that they did come out there to kill not to arrest. They could have done that any time. They did not come out there because of any complaints from neighbors. Those running this country, this entire worldwide system, have never cared about black people complaining about their neighbors. That's never been an issue. So obviously it was something other than that, which is our unrelenting fight for our family members. They shot over 10,000 rounds of bullets in on us within 90 minutes. They dropped a bomb. Two, on two our bombs, room. wasn't it? They dropped one, and they had a backup bomb. Oh. The bomb that they dropped ignited a fire, which the fire department, who was out there from the very beginning, uh, was made immediately aware that there was a fire on our roof. And a conscious decision was made not to fight the fire, to let it burn. When we realized our, our home was on fire, we immediately tried to get our children, our animals, and ourselves out of that blazing inferno. The instant we were visible to cops trying to come out of our home, we were met by a barrage of police gunfire aimed at us so that we couldn't escape that fire. Um, after several attempts to get out, I got out first. I was able to get one of our children, a, a little boy named Birdie, out. And we were immediately snatched into custody. And it was just a little bit later that I found out that, you know, nobody else survived. I am the only one to be tried for anything, including everything they that in, they did. They put you in jail for seven years. Seven years for, for the accusation for, of riot. And, and the people who pulled the triggers, what happened? The people that killed my family was never charged, never prosecuted, never imprisoned for anything. And, and, and we should add that the entire, that fire spread and Very burned quickly. down the entire block, 61 homes. Great, thank you. When we come back, we'll hear more from Ramona and Pam, Africa from the Revolutionary Organization Move. Earlier today, President Obama Senate Republicans have previously stated and led the component responsible for poisoning people in Flint. There is always hope. That's what goes Trump on in the U.S. Why are women supposed to exist in police force? Here's something else.
I'm Tom Harpin, and I'll give you what the mainstream media can't, the big picture. We'll go deeper, investigate, and debate, all so you can get the big picture. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. Real? The only show I go out of my way to watch him. Really it really packs a punch. Wow. Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. Yeah, the same hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. All the world's a stage. And all the news companies, merely players. But what kind of part does RT America play? RT America offers more. RT America offers more. In many ways, the news landscape is just like the theater. Real news. Fake news. Good actors. Bad actors. And in the end, you can never outwit your audience. So what part can we play? All the world's a stage. All the world's a stage. All the world's a stage. And we are definitely a player. On Contact with Chris Hedges. Welcome back to On Contact. Let's continue our conversation with Ramona and Pam Africa from the revolutionary organization MOVE. So you were part of MOVE. Uh, Mumia still am still am still. of course <laughs> yeah. and Mumia was you know one of the most important journalists in Philadelphia and I think the first time he had contact with move is when he was covering a, 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 a I don't want to call it rally because it was $25 a ticket <laughs> to hear Jesse Jackson were you there? I was not. Do you know? That? I wasn't there either. Uh, but I do know a few of the particulars. For example, that Mumia did not understand why Move was protesting right. Jesse Jackson. They were protesting outside the hall where Jackson right. was speaking. And he asked Jesse Jackson, you know, what, what's going on here? Why are they um, protesting? And what Jesse Jackson responded with was, oh, I don't know. Who cares about those nappy head <laughs> that don't even comb their hair? Well, Mumia wanted to know why. <laughs> he writes in his book, I Care. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing about that, you know, Mumia throughout the years had been correcting people and all through examples and the story of Move and all he made people more sensitive and that made Mumia a target and all because this government did not want people to understand who Move is, Move is who and who... John African Right, is. and who John African This is the founder is. of Move. Yes. yes. But well, one of the things, I mean, we did what any good journalist should do, exactly. which is that he listened. Exactly. He wasn't a member of Move. Initially, he was told he couldn't report on Move, and he didn't, and then he defied his own bosses. One of the things that turned Mumia around, too, and that made him understand there was something happening with Mood. My sister Janine Africa's three-week-old baby was trampled to death by Philadelphia police. And Mumia came not just to cover, you know, a tragedy like that, but he took time and sat there and let Janine, you know, talk at her own pace and very patient and all of that. You know, he also went to the neighborhood and he talked to the neighbors. He talked to a man named Mr. Wallace who lived across the street. And, you know, he was telling them about Move and, all you know, how, you know, he loved them. He used to call them children. He told them about the night that Janine's baby was murdered in detail, how the cops came from, you know, um, different angles and clothes move in. He also talked about the fact that they were from different precincts. So for them to say that they were coming to Move because of disturbing the peace and all, 
you don't come with three different precincts. They right. came to maim, murder, and kill, and they did just that, and to lock up, move people. Let, let me ask about, I mean, he was such an important figure because of his intellect, because of his integrity. Um, clearly the system was gunning for him. We don't have time to go into the trial, right. but people should go look, um, you know, even by the degraded uh, standards of the American judicial system. This cannot be considered in any way a trial, tainted evidence, witnesses who lied, you know, witnesses who were there and test would have testified on his behalf. The trial not allowed judge in. said, I'm going to help them fry the Right. Now that was right. the trial right. judge. Right. right. Well, it's not just outside, mm -hmm. but inside. And so they passed a, a state law that initially prohibited Mumia from carrying out interviews. Mm -hmm. And then when it was challenged, they just decided no one can carry out interviews from inside. Is it death row or the entire prison system, right? The, the entire, entire prison. Pennsylvania right. prison system. Right. right. And, you know, through the power of the people, everyone joined together and uh, the attorney, Brett Brody, and several other, um, you know, prison organization, prison legal news uh, lawyers, and all, all, they all came together and they won that case. And uh, that's another detailed thing that you can find on these websites, and, uh, because it's very important that people understand the victories in the case with Momia and uh, um, the victories and how we were able to get him the medication, the victory and well, how we Well, this is we, we should back up and court. say he has hepatitis C, yes. and they denied him medication because because in our charming capitalist system, it costs $1,000 a pill, here. which here, and about $7 a pill in another, in, you know, in, in Egypt, Egypt or, or India, India or something. India. Um, and they don't want to pay for it. They don't, because these are for profit healthcare systems. Uh, they don't want to provide care. We have the other issue, which is often unnoticed, but is very important, and that is contaminated water. Uh, perhaps you can speak, Ramona, a little bit about that because you have a brother who's... Our brother, Mike oh, Africa, is in uh, Greater Prison in Pennsylvania. Our brother, Eddie Africa, is at uh, SCI Mahanoy, where Mumia it's is. It's in Frackville. Right. And it's just unbelievable. Well, explain a little bit how it works. Yeah. What happened is we found out from our brother, Mike Africa, that the water smell, mm. you know, it's it stunk. Even the water you had to shower with, not to mention the water you had to drink. And we started dealing with that. We called the Environmental Protection Department, got one of their representatives to go up there to Greaterford. And then when we asked uh, Eddie and Mumia about the water there, they were saying the same thing. It's contaminated. The water is dark. You know, it's not clear. It tastes horrible, has a smell. And this is the water that these prisoners are supposed Which to drink. Which the guards don't drink. No, they don't. They bring in their own right. bottled water. And in some prisons, they're supplied with bottled water. We've had a situation where uh, lawyers from Amia have gone back into court. Um, and perhaps you can, Ramona, tell us a little bit about where we are legally with his case at this moment. Well, what's happening is there was a, a case in the U.S. Supreme Court, and it's about prosecutors or head prosecutors, head district attorneys, moving through the ranks in the courts, like becoming judges and moving <clears throat> up to the uh, courts, Pennsylvania Supreme Court, for example. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that that is patently unconstitutional. You cannot rule on an appeal to, for example, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court if you've been intimately involved in the prosecution of this case. Well, Ron Castile was the prosecutor, head prosecutor, during Mumia's case and uh, became a Pennsylvania Supreme Court judge who refused to recuse himself from Mumia's appeals. So now attorneys for Mumia are back in court saying that this decision that the U.S. Supreme Court made applies to Mumia. We need all the discovery, everything 
from the DA's office so that we can go through it and show exactly how intimately, you know, uh, Ron Castile. And they did, there was a, a hearing, right? There was a hearing and a ruling that. On Lumia's birthday. Yeah, April 24. April 24 oh, really? Yeah. That uh, the DA's office had to turn over this information to the defense team. Let me ask you, Pam, I mean, this is something you've been fighting this kind of injustice against MOVE members, against Mumia for decades. And other political and prisoners. And other political prisoners, too. Yeah. Sundiata, yeah. Akoli, Akoli Matulu Shakur, Geronimo Pratt. Geronimo, um, when he was in. What keeps you going? I mean, you, that, the weight the, of not just state oppression, but the demonization of these figures by the media or indifference, utter indifference, what keeps you going? John Africa. Mm -hmm. John Africa, very simply. And uh, what he instilled in each and every last mood person, and you'll see it in our young children as well, and uh, the fact to be consistent and uh, always seek the truth and put the truth out there to people. And it works, and uh, because when Mumia case came up, and uh, there were people in that courtroom from France, they were in there yeah. from Germany, they was from across the world. When Mumia last week, we didn't know where he was at. Uh, one phone call was made, two phone calls was made, and it set off a, a power surge around the world on the prison tips to the fact that the following day, and uh, you know, they said that you know they'll be having Mumia come to a visit. Mumia said when. They brought him back from the infirmary and uh, that they told him that he had a visit and he was getting ready to come out his infirmary clothes. They said, no, no, <laughs> go on out there, you have a visit. And that's how he went out. But when you're able to pull the power of the people and, uh, and direct that, and uh, you can get these results. We've had one victory after another with Mumia right. and uh, through doing this strategy. And the bottom line is John Africa have shown us clearly it's not a choice yeah. you don't have a choice not to defend yourself and your family and defend what's right what else are you going to do they dropped the bomb on me and my family right. murdered my family i'm supposed to say oh well you know it's all over and what go on to law school after that no Which that's where you were like once that. headed mm -hmm. well great thank you very much I have a lot You're of very courage. welcome that was Ramona and Pam Africa from the revolutionary organization MOVE and organizers with the International Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Max Weber, in his essay, Politics as a Vocation, wrote that those who dedicate their lives to striving for justice in the modern political arena are like the classical heroes who can never overcome what the ancient Greeks called fate or fortuna. These heroes rise up nevertheless, unable to quell their righteous anger at the abuses of power and their quixotic hope for a better world. Faced with certain defeat, or in the case of Umiya Abu Jamal, a death sentence, these long distance revolutionaries keep the flames of liberty and equality alive. They don't usually win or they win rarely, but this is why politics is a vocation. It is a constant occupation it is an eternal fight. This fight passes from one generation to the next. Few embody the glory and pathos of this fight more powerfully than Mumia Abu Jamal. Thank you for watching. You can find us on rt.com slash on contact. See you next week.